Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this panel on elections and disability rights. I'm Virginia Atkinson, and I'm IFAS's Access and Inclusion Specialist. So I work um, in all of our projects around the world to include people with disabilities in democracy and governance. 15% uh, of the world's population is estimated to have a disability. So think about in your countries, considering the fact that many people with disabilities encounter a lot of barriers to political participation, think about what a large portion of the population that is and a large portion of your citizens that are not able to vote. So people with disabilities encounter a lot of different types of barriers to participation in political life. Some of those are maybe a little bit more obvious, such as physical barriers. So for example, maybe a polling station that's held on a second or third floor, um, a voter registration center that's not in an accessible location. There's also barriers related to information. So is the information that the election commission issues about where to go to vote, how to vote, how to register to vote, is all of that information disseminated in an accessible format, such as sign language or braille, large print, et cetera. And then there's a third type of barrier, which is a lot more difficult and pervasive, and that's legal barriers. So many election laws contain clauses that are discriminatory towards people with disabilities, um, and people with intellectual disabilities in particular. The US, 24 years ago, became the first country um, to enact disability rights legislation that banned discrimination against people with disabilities. And this legislation has gone on to produce um, additional acts, such as the Help America Vote Act, that is specifically related to voting and providing access and inclusion to the political process. So I'm joined today um, by an esteemed panel We've <laughs> who is, is, is going to talk a little bit more about um, access to the political process and how the U.S. standards have been used to dr help draft the U.N. Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this treaty is really the, the main international standard, gold standard, in terms of access and inclusion of people with disabilities in all areas, including participation in political and public life. So on the panel today, we have Judy Human at the very end here, and she is the um, Special Advisor for International Disability Rights at the Department of State. And this is a presidential level appointee position um, where she works at the State Department to ensure disability rights are addressed in U.S. diplomacy. And Judy's an internationally recognized civil rights leader. Prior to, to joining the State Department, she also worked at the World Bank. She, under the Clinton administration, she was in the Department of Education. Um, so she's, she's really an all-around star in terms of disability rights. <laughs> and then right beside Judy, we have Charlotte McLean Nalapo. Charlotte is the coordinator for disability and inclusive development at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And so Charlotte's position was also um, an, appointed by President Obama. And in her role at USAID, she works to mainstream the rights of people with disabilities in all of the US government's um, development funding. Prior to joining USAID, Charlotte was also at the World Bank and um, was appointed by President Nelson Mandela to serve on the South African Human Rights Commission. Then here right beside me, we have Louis Bossling, who is a senior staff attorney at the Bazelon Center. This organization was founded over 40 years ago and advocates for the rights of people um, with mental disabilities. And so in that capacity, Lewis um, has brought some pamphlets that are handed out here about work that the Bazelon Center has done on access and inclusion and legal barriers that people with disabilities might encounter. Um, prior to joining the Bazelon Center, Lewis also worked at the Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Bureau um, and did some litigation around the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we have quite a, an impressive and exciting panel here today. Um, each of our panelists is going to talk for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to have the remainder of our time together open to question and answer. So I'm going to start off with Judy at the end here, who's going to give an overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Help America Vote Act, and talk a little bit about some specific provisions that the U.S. government has done in order to increase access to the political process. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. Um, very nice to be here, and I appreciate the fact that IFAS has very much committed itself to the inclusion of disabled people in voting. And um, I don't know if you've already been told, but IFAS has just been awarded a grant from the State Department as part of a consortia uh, with Mobility International USA, the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, and 
the United States International Council on Disability, and it's a uh, pilot project, and they're going to be working it beginning in three countries uh, to help people learn more about some of our laws and to work uh, like the Americans with Disabilities Act and to learn about leadership development and to basically be available to help, in this case, Vietnam, Kenya, and Mexico, Mexico to um, continue to move forward as they work on the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'm going to try to focus uh, mainly on the Voting Rights Act and uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, start off by saying that I'm almost 67 years old and so I have the uh, privilege of being able to speak about what the United States was like when I was growing up and I think it's an important issue to raise because um, many countries are still working on making their countries more accessible in order to be able to ensure equal rights for disabled individuals. And the Americans with Disabilities Act, which didn't come into the United States, it wasn't passed into law until 1990, uh, really has been one of the major pieces of legislation uh, granting disabled individuals rights in the public and private sector. And voting is one critical component um, of this law. When I first voted when I was 18 years old in New York, uh, we had no laws requiring accessibility for disabled individuals. So I voted in my neighborhood. There were four steps into the voting uh, a polling place and my father carried me up those four steps and helped me with voting because I couldn't uh, utilize the um, materials to be able to exercise a free vote. And um, my father did what I asked him to do, but today, um, because of uh, the changes in our legislation, I can actually get into a polling place and I can vote by myself. So as we all know, you wouldn't be here otherwise, the issue of voting is critical. It's really uh, important to help ensure democracies. And in the case of the disability community, we know because of the World Health Organization and World Bank that at least 15% of the population of people around the world have disabilities. This is a very large percentage of individuals, which quite frankly, um, as voting becomes accessible and disabled people can both more freely participate in elections as well as run for political office, um, it should be something that parties are interested in reaching out to the disability community because it's a large enough population that in fact between people themselves who have disabilities, friends and colleagues and family can in fact influence elections. Uh, we have a number of laws in the United States which address the issue of voting. The first one is the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is, as I mentioned, a federal civil rights law that provides protections to people with disabilities that are similar protections that are provided for other individuals in the United States in the areas of race, color, sex, national origin, age, and religion. One um, similarity in the United States is that civil rights legislation, which we had passed in the 1960s in a number of areas, uh, which included the right to vote, did not at that time period include access to voting for individuals who had disabilities. So it was the Americans with Disabilities Act which actually allowed the disability community to be able to catch up to the rights that others with disabilities had. Um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, contained provisions relevant to the voting rights for people with disabilities, but not extent as extensive as the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the Voting Rights Act requires election officials to allow a voter who is blind or has another disability to receive assistance uh, when voting. Another very important piece of legislation in the United States is the Help America Vote Act, uh, which we call HAVA. It was passed in 2002, and it requires that jurisdictions um, are responsible for conducting federal, that are con responsible for conducting elections, provide at least one accessible voting system for persons with disabilities at each polling place in federal elections. And the accessible voting system 
must provide the same opportunity for access and participation, including privacy and independence. Now, when we look at the issue of voting, obviously we also in the United States um, are requiring registration. And so when someone goes to register uh, to vote, um, they also must be assured the right to be able to register to vote. So it, the law itself requires that all offices which provide public assistance or state-funded agencies have to ensure that disabled individuals have the opportunity to register to vote by providing voter registration forms and assisting voters in completing these forms and transmitting completed forms to the appropriate sources. Uh, we also have expanded um, entities that we are um, requiring provide information for disabled individuals to let them know that should they wish to register to vote, they can register, for example, through one of our federal agencies that assists disabled individuals in receiving training um, to be able to move into the world of work and other organizations like uh, the national, uh, local community-based groups called Centers for Independent Living. So we've both looked at the importance of enabling disabled people to register to vote as well as to vote. And I think this is a very important point because if disabled people within a country have felt excluded and in the past were not able to vote, uh, then in fact they may not believe that things have been changing to enable them to vote. So putting messages out in many different ways to enable people to know that yes, they are encouraged to vote and yes, they can register and can be assured greater access to the ability to vote. Um, now, as far as requiring accessible voting places. So elections in the United States um, are held in many different places, such as schools or religious institutions, as well as public or private buildings. Um, and so when an election is being held, there may have to be accommodations for the place where someone is voting that may be temporary. So, for example, um, we may have elections in libraries, or in schools, or in fire stations, or churches, or stores, or private buildings. And what we would be looking for uh, would be the ability for a person to gain access into the building. So there would need to be an accessible route into the building, places to park, um, there would need to be a ramp into the building in the event that um, there was not access previously. That ramp for the sake of the election would not necessarily have to be permanent um, because the voting place may be a temporary voting place. And details, uh, attention would have to be paid to things like being able to get through the door, to be able to get to the place where one would vote and that the area where a person would be exercising their right to vote would be accessible for someone uh, who may use a wheelchair or have other kinds of uh, uh, technology. Uh, guide dogs, dogs and other animals that a disabled person may use uh, to be able to be more independent in the community must be permitted into the place where someone is gonna be voting. The Department of Justice, which is the agency that has responsibility for overseeing elections in the United States in the area of race, the other categories I mentioned, and disability, um, has expanded its election day monitoring. And I believe a number of you are gonna be going out tomorrow to uh, voting places. And uh, if you wish, you can certainly ask them about uh, accessibility for disabled individuals to vote. Um, the election site, they have responsibility to ensure that individuals who are um, giving uh, people the appropriate materials to vote um, have been trained uh, to work with people who have disabilities so that they can give people information about what is available. Um, and a disabled person who needs assistance in voting is allowed to bring some wi someone with them into the voting uh, poll to be able to actually vote. 
there, one of the other uh, important parts of what is going on with the Department of Justice is the fact that people can file complaints in the event that they believe that the voting place is not accessible. Um, and uh, the Department of Justice has had a number of findings uh, in this area. And I've brought a couple of copies of a recent uh, case that the Department of Justice had with an, a district in Texas. And so I brought four copies. And if you want to make more copies, uh, Virginia will be able to help do that. So I think that's a, a very broad overview. And we can get into more specifics when we get into Q&As. Thank you, Judy. Um, thanks in particular for pointing out, I think, what are two key things that are often overlooked. Uh, one is the focus on voter registration. So any sort of accommodations that you might make later on in the, voter, the voting process, in the electoral process, aren't going to have nearly as big of an impact if people with disabilities aren't able to register to vote in the first place. So I think that's a really key area to focus on is the registration process and making sure that that's accessible and inclusive. Um, and the other thing that's also often a really big barrier is that sometimes election commissions in IFAS's experience will develop assistive devices, for example, tactile ballot guides, so that those will allow people that are blind to vote on their own and in secret. But they won't train poll workers on how to use those devices. And so all of this money goes into the development of assistive tools, and then they're not used because the, the poll workers don't know how to use the tool, and the voters have not been educated that this tool exists. And so I think that's another unique aspect of U.S. law in that it's required, this type of training. If a new tool is rolled out, the poll workers need to be trained on it, and there also needs to be education to the general public that these tools are available. Um, so sh Judy gave a really good overview of, of U.S. legislation and steps that the U.S. is taking. Um, Charlotte is going to talk next a little bit about how the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Help America Vote Act, et cetera, were used to sort of lay the groundwork and influence the U.N. Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and she's also going to talk a little bit about work that USAID has done in this space. Great, thank you very much, Virginia. And I'd like to I'd like to thank I'd like to thank the organizers, IFAS, for um, inviting me to be part of this very distinguished panel, um, and also really to just thank IFAS for their relentless commitment to including persons with disabilities in the electoral, but also very importantly in the political participation process. Mm -hmm. I was asked by Virginia to speak a bit about Article 29 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and then share with you some examples of emerging vignettes of good practice that, that, we're, that, that we're aware of. But I'd like to preface my, my remarks this afternoon with a, with a general reflection. Um, and, and my reflection is that in many countries, the history of the right to vote is, has been really defined by exclusions, if, if we think about it writ large. Um, and, and, and I think for me that that's an important piece of information to base all of my kind of thinking around. Because I, I never want us to lose sight of the fact that women and men have sacrificed their lives for the, for the ability for the right to vote. People have been exiled for the right to vote. People have gone to jail. Nelson Mandela went to jail for 27 years for the right to vote. Um, and so I, I guess it's more of a plea, not that I need to ask you guys to do this because that's why you're here, but it's really to, to, to underscore the importance of never taking for granted the importance of the right to vote because it really embodies, um, it embodies the spirit of democracy. And that's something that people with disabilities want as much as anybody else. So that's just kind of by way of preface. So I mean, I think it's, it's fairly, it's, fairly um, it's, a, it's acknowledged that the right to vote and to participate in, in politics is very much the cornerstone of um, international human rights law. Um, and yet, people with disabilities are, are often denied this right. As both Judy and Virginia pointed out, and I'll repeat it because in this instance, I think repetition is a good thing. Uh, persons with disabilities make up 15% of the world's population. So this is a significant population that we're talking about. It's also important to recognize that 80% of persons with disabilities live in the developing world. So they're living in the countries in which you come from 
and certainly in the countries in which we work and partner. But yet too often people with disabilities are excluded from both the electoral and the political process. And as Judy mentioned, this is often due to discriminatory laws, um, but the, it's not just in the actual voting, it's also in the, uh, they are discriminated against in terms of holding office or monitoring elections and other kind of political, uh, political and public duties. I think too often people with disability, there's an assumption that people with disabilities are unable or uninterested to participate. Um, and so states really fail to provide the necessary accommodations that would enable persons with disabilities to participate. And if we recognize that participation is really one of the most, is, is one of the key pieces of political and public life, by excluding people with disabilities, we're preventing them from, from taking part um, in, in social, social life. I think it's also important for us to think about how participation extends beyond just voting. And I, I know I've mentioned this before already, but it's really important for me to think about participation as also part of decision making a process of developing policy, a process of being part of the social fabric. So let me turn right now to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and in particular, Article 29. So this article establishes that state parties shall guarantee political rights to persons with disabilities. And it provides an opportunity for persons <laughs> with disabilities to enjoy those political rights on, this, on an equal basis as others. So it's not asking for a separate kind of regime, political regime or electoral regime for persons with disabilities. It's on an equal basis with others. However, that requires addressing the reasonable accommodations that Judy mentioned. In my view, Article 29 is a very pragmatic article. And it requires the processes related to participation. And so it addresses issues around uh, such as accessibility. Um, and it addresses issues around how you, we can progressively move towards accessibility um, within the physical environment. But it also addresses the importance of other aspects of accessibility, such as information and communication technology. Article 29 cannot be read in isolation. And that too is a very important piece. It has to be read in conjunction or in collaboration with the other rights that are entrenched in the CRPD. Um, for instance, if you are talking about the right to vote and solely focusing on Article 29, you may miss the fact that there are rights in the, con in the convention that speak to the right to accessibility. If you don't have accessible transportation, if you don't have accessible infrastructure, that right in Article 29 becomes very difficult. So it's really important for us to recognize that these rights are interconnected um, and mutually reinforcing. Now, I would like to just briefly mention some of the challenges that people with disabilities access in, in, um, in enjoying their right to vote. The one important issue is in access to information communication. And accessibility remains a major challenge for how people with disabilities engage in, in, in the voting processes or the electoral process. Another major challenge, and that too has been mentioned by my colleagues, is the issue around the lack of normative frameworks. Or where you have legislation, but you don't have mechanisms to enforce that legislation. I see a lot of heads nodding in the room. We often have great legislation, but we just don't have the mechanisms to make sure that that's enforced. So those to me are some two, are key, two major um, back, um, challenges but I, I have to say that I, I'm very optimistic because I think that increasingly we are beginning to see a lot of good examples. And I think, you know, ha um, HAVA and certainly the ADA has paved the way for that.
and, and the practices that we, that we employ, employ in the states in terms of ensuring accessible elections. Um, so I won't go through all of the, the points because Judy had touched on many of them, but a few that sh I would like to, to touch on that perhaps she didn't is, is the importance of raising awareness also amongst parliamentarians. That for me is an important piece of this package because again, we often think about accessibility only in the physical sense. How do we ensure that there are ramps? How do we ensure that there are tactile ballots? But it's, it is a process and we have to make sure that we have a no gap approach to ensuring um, full and seamless accessibility for um, inclusion of persons with disabilities. So working with electoral bodies such as yourselves is clearly an important piece. Um, I th Vic, uh, Vic, Virginia mentioned the importance of the, um, voter registration, as did Judy, that's really important. The training of polling um, station officials is absolutely key. And that is often, I would argue, best done by working with persons with disabilities to actually embark or engage on that in that training. And I'll come to that in, the, in a minute. So that is an exciting space. Also, as I was waiting to come in to the session this e afternoon, I was talking to a colleague and she was telling me about how they're looking at online, online voting. And so how can we use ICT in its broader sense to start thinking about you know, online voting as a, possi as, as a way to begin to include persons with disabilities, but actually not just persons with disabilities, a whole range of people. Think about how this would revolutionize the issue for aging people. Think about how this would be useful for people who live in very remote areas. So online, online um, voting is certainly an exciting prospect going forward. Finally, I'd like to share with you what I think are some instructive examples um, that I see um, have been influenced by the application of Article 29 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I'm not going to delve too deeply into the actual cases, I'm just going to highlight them. And if any of you are interested in you know, background information, I'm happy to provide that. Um, and so I just wanted to mention um, a, ca a case in Peru where voting rights were restored to thousands of persons with disabilities. Um, and this was after 20,000 people with um, intellectual disabilities had been excluded from the voters from the voters' roll. Um, and what happened in this case was that there was a resolution that mandated the, reg the registry to issue national identity cards to persons with disabilities so that they could vote. So this whole, the, whole, the, the exclusion of this group of people was overturned and people were then able to, to, to um, participate in the electoral process. In Jordan, USAID supported um, persons with disabilities in a campaign called Takafo. And Takafo sought to change an election, an, electro, an election law that did not reflect the tenets of the CRPD, Article 29. So what, what was happening previously was that people with certain types of disabilities would go to the polling station without personal assistance. And personal assistance were not provided at the polling stations, which meant that they were not able to vote. And so what was happening there was that the, the person with disability would have to an, announce their candidate's name in the presence of a committee. That is not, that is not a secret vote. Um, but fortunately, that has, the Senate has since addressed this issue and persons with disabilities now can vote with their personal assistance. So I think we're beginning to see how Article 29 is really beginning to change the dynamics around how we include persons with disabilities um, in, 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 in electoral processes. Two other examples, three other examples that I'd like to share briefly is in Kenya. In Kenya, USAID supported the presence of a sign language interpreter during the last televised political debates. Again, not just the election, the end part of the elections, but the process around elections. Um, in Paraguay, USAID recently signed an, a memorandum of understanding with the, tri with the electoral tribunal to, 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 to think about um, inclusive elections going forward. And then finally, I wanted to share an example 
uh, from South Africa that touched on a point that, that I think Virginia had mentioned, and that was that in South Africa, the Independent Electoral Commi Commission contracted DEFSA, which is the Deaf Federation of, of South Africa, and the Federation and um, Blind Organization of South Africa to work with the, 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 the IEC to develop manuals, to develop, to actually do the training. And so they brought in the experts, and this has proven to be very successful. I share with you these examples because I think we're really beginning to see that it is possible to break down barriers, and that breaking down barriers is beneficial not just to people with disabilities, but is beneficial to a whole range of, 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 of people. Um, I just want to end by saying that USAID remains committed to furthering the human rights of persons with disabilities and recognizing that the right to vote is, is an essential and an inalienable right. Um, we continue to support our partners and are very happy to say that in your bags there is a, a manual that was produced by IFAS, supported by USAID, that has been hugely successful in, in our missions and is being used to, um, inf to inform colleagues around how to include persons with disabilities. I just want to lastly, Virginia, say that I think for me the important piece around this is the impact and the benefit of including persons with disabilities. Not only are we potentially bringing in a large percentage, the 15%, but also we know that societies that are inclusive are often more democratic. Um, and we also know that Societies that are more democratic are those societies that are more often to meet their development goals. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks also for pointing out um, how many accommodations that might make the voting process more accessible for people with disabilities are often helpful for the, the general public. And so it's a really good investment on multiple different levels. Um, and also for the examples of what's happening all around the world, it's also really encouraging to hear good examples of good practice that can be emulated in other places. Um, Charlotte also mentioned that the Article 29, which is on political participation of the UN Convention on Disability, shouldn't be read in isolation. Um, there's another article of the UN Disability Treaty, which is Article 12, and that's focused on legal capacity. Um, so our next speaker, Lewis, is going to address legal capacity um, issues and, and how the U.S. is addressing those barriers and give some examples of things that are happening here and some trends in that regard. Thanks, Virginia. Um, I'm really pleased to have the chance to speak with you today about an issue that, that you may or may not be aware of or may, not, may or may not be working on. And, and that is the voting rights of people with mental disabilities. Um, as Virginia mentioned, I work at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, which is a non-governmental organization here in the U.S. that advocates for the rights of people with mental disabilities to live independent and integrated lives in their own homes and communities. Uh, what do I mean by people with mental disabilities? Um, we, I mean the, the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities, um, which in the United States we used to call insane people or the mentally ill. Uh, the Bazelon Center also works on behalf of people with developmental, intellectual, or cognitive disabilities, which in the United States, in our laws and in our uh, media, we used to call the mentally retarded. Um, these are old words that were enshrined in our laws and, and commonly used in our media. Um, we tend not to use them in the United States anymore. Uh, today, I'll use the term people with mental disabilities to describe the group of people that I'm talking about. Um, my office, the Bazelon Center, has worked for decades to ensure that people with mental disabilities have the right to vote. Um, we work on this issue with other uh, disability rights organizations here in the U.S., like the National Disability Rights Network and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. In the U.S., as, as uh, Charlotte and Judith have described, we see voting as a fundamental right. Um, we think that by expressing our views through voting, we can help ensure that our government develops and implements good policies and practices and protects our civil and human rights. As uh, Judith noted, 
In general, in the US, uh, the act of voting has been made far more accessible for people with disabilities with the passage of laws like the Voting Rights Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Help America Vote Act. These laws all require our state and local governments, which are primarily responsible for conducting elections in the US, to make sure that people with disabilities have equal access to voting with support or accommodations if need be. Much of the attention in the United States and perhaps around the world has focused on uh, the physical accessibility of polling places, whether or not people with physical disabilities can vote in the same location and manner as everyone else with support or accommodations if needed, and whether they can vote independently and privately as everyone else does. But the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act, the Help America Vote Act, the US Constitution also protects the rights of people with mental disabilities. Um, disability advocates in the US are still fighting battles over the rights of people with mental disabilities to vote. Some of these are battles over outdated language in some of our state laws, which have imposed categorical restrictions on the voting rights of people with disabilities. And some of these are battles over the practices and assumptions our judges and election officials and others make in determining who is competent to vote or who has the capacity to vote. I'll, I'll touch on both of these issues uh, today. I also want to highlight the efforts of disability advocates in the US to inform people with mental disabilities, their advocates, and people who are responsible for elections about the types of assistance or accommodations that can help ensure that everyone has an opportunity to vote. Um, just with regard to voter competence requirements, um, many of our state constitutions and our state voting laws in this country require that voters have a certain level of competence in order to be able to vote. There are still about 13 US states and the District of Columbia, where we are today, that have laws that bar voting by individuals whom a judge has ruled are mentally incapacitated or mentally incompetent. After such a ruling, the judge usually places that person under guardianship, meaning that the judge names another person a guardian or in some states a conservator to make certain decisions for the person under guardianship. In these states, you still may not be able to vote if you have a guardian. These laws are a problem, we think, because this language in the laws singles out persons with mental disabilities for different treatment from everyone else. Also, use of these terms is overbroad just because a uh, person has a guardian to assist in decision-making about certain types of decisions, like financial decisions or decisions around living arrangements, doesn't mean that the person doesn't have an understanding about how elections work and have a preference about who to vote for or what to vote for. There are also states in the United States that have laws that use stigmatizing terms such as idiots, or insane persons, the kind of terms I was referring to earlier, to describe who is barred from voting based on competence concerns. This is a problem. Stigma around the capacity of people with disabilities to make independent decisions is too often a basis for dis disability discrimination. Another problem we face here is that in all of the states with voter competence standards, only a court of competent jurisdiction, usually a state probate court, is supposed to make a determination about who is competent to vote. But we know that over the years, there have been situations in which election officials, poll workers, guardians, or service providers, including staff from nursing homes or other institutional settings that serve people with mental disabilities, have prevented those people from voting because of a perceived lack of competence to vote. This is a highly problematic uh, issue and we think uh, a violation of 
the United States Constitution, when people other than judges make decisions based on assumptions about who can and can't vote. Now, I've mentioned voter competence standards. At the Bazelon Center, we generally think that there's no need to have voter competence standards that may target people with mental disabilities. From what we know, there's no US state or no nation uh, anywhere else in the world that subjects people without disabilities to any type of standard to measure their voting capacity. We don't generally expect voters without disabilities to dis demonstrate the rationale for their votes or their understanding of how the voting process works. We shouldn't expect that of people with mental disabilities either. There are at least 11 states in the United States that don't have any competence standard for voting, and there's no indication that the election systems in those states have been compromised by the votes of people with mental disabilities. To the extent that states choose to have a voter competence requirement, we think that all individuals in the state should be held to the same standard, and that given that the essence of voting is expressing a choice, the standard should be whether a person can communicate with or without accommodations, a choice whether to cast a vote. This standard should be the same for a person with a mental disability as for anyone else, whether a person can express a choice. In 2007, the American Bar Association, which is a, a non-governmental organization representing the community of lawyers in the United States, adopted a similar standard for determining voter competence, whether a person can communicate with or without accommodations a specific desire to participate in the voting process. And that's very similar, if not identical, to the standard that, that we at the Bazelon Center and other disability advocates would uh, propose. Uh, the ABA, uh, the American Bar Association standard, also requires that no prohibition on an individual's voting take place unless it is ordered by a court of competent jurisdiction that has afforded the individual appropriate due process protections and that the court's order is based on clear and convincing evidence. And these are all protections that are important to ensuring that the fundamental right to vote is not taken away from an individual in error. Since uh, the American Bar Association adopted this standard, at least two American states have adopted the standard. I've, I've heard that some of you will be traveling to Maryland tomorrow to look at polling places in that state, that next door state. Uh, Maryland adopted the American Bar Association standard, as did the uh, western state of Nevada. Although we appreciate the changes that these states have made, um, this, uh, this, this language is, is much better than what was in the voting laws before. Still, there are issues in other US states. In July of this year, advocates in California filed a civil rights complaint with the United States Department of Justice, alleging that thousands of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, autism, lost their right to vote. Um, according to the advocates, uh, in a sample of cases they reviewed from Los Angeles, California, 90% of people under guardianship had been disqualified from voting because the judge used a literacy test to determine whether the person was qualified to vote. As I said before, we think that the only test that should be used to determine if someone can vote is whether a person can express a choice. And we should apply that test to everyone, not just people with disabilities. We don't use a literacy test in the United States to determine if people without disabilities can vote. And we shouldn't use one to determine if people with disabilities can vote. I had just a couple of other points that I wanted to mention. One was uh, the impact of the CRPD on this issue. Uh, Charlotte re mentioned that uh, their Article 29 covers access to voting. Uh, there's also Article 12 of the CRPD, which uh, states that states that ratify the CRPD shall recognize that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life including, I would argue, voting. 
Um, the CRPD also states that member uh, assignatories shall take appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require in exercising their legal capacity, including exercising the right to vote. I just wanted to s briefly touch on the kinds of accommodations that um, people with mental, mental disabilities need in voting. Um, there are at least five principles that uh, we'd like to see disseminated to people with disabilities, their families and friends, their advocates, election officials, poll workers, and service providers about how to help a person with a mental disability vote. Number one, people with mental disabilities should have the right to get help with voting and to decide who will help them vote. Number two, a person with a disability should be able to get help from a friend, a family member, a caregiver, a residential service provider, or almost anyone else of his or her choosing, except under US law, under the Voting Rights Act, the person's employer or a fellow union member. In the United States, a person can also ask a poll worker for assistance with voting. Number three, a person helping a voter with a disability should ask the voter what choice he or she wants to make, if any. It is the voter who makes the choice whether to vote and how to vote, not the person providing help. Number four, the person providing help should not mark a ballot to reflect any choice other than the choice expressed by the voter. Again, it's the voter's choice, not the helper's choice. And number five, the person providing help should respect the voter's privacy at all times during the voting process. In the United States, everyone else gets to vote in private, and we should try to make sure that the voting price process is as private as possible for people with mental disabilities. The uh, handouts that are at your tables describe these principles and everything else I've been talking about in more detail. So. Um, Please look to them, they're in English, but they're also available online if, uh, if there aren't enough to go around today. Um, just to conclude, we've, we've made significant progress in this area, but we still have a long way to go in the United States and in other countries before people with mental disabilities consistently have an equal opportunity to participate in the voting process. We appreciate the IFES's leadership in this area and we look forward to working with the IFES and all of you to make this goal a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. And thanks for pointing out sort of the intersection between Article 29 on participation in political and public life and Article 12 on legal capacity and how combined those two articles, um, which by the way, the CRPD has been at least signed by over 80% of UN member states. So this is pretty much, you know, international standard at this point. And when you combine those two international treaty, international, um, the, the two articles from the, the CRPD, how that really means that people with any type of disability should not be discriminated against in terms of their voting rights. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm just gonna take uh, maybe one question. If you could please say your name and where you're from. I see a hand really quickly right up front. Um, thank you very much. I have uh, dozens of questions actually, but then I may not be able to ask all of them. Um, uh, some example of uh, my own country. Disabled people in Nepal, I'm from Nepal, I'm chairperson of Election Commission of Nepal. Disabled persons are treated differently, of course, in those countries where education is still in a primitive stage, probably. And I, I have seen um, parents treating differently, even if they are um, not mentally disabled, and they are kept uh, in home and, you know, tight and then kept there for um, up to, you know, uh, elder age, and uh, even if they are capable of, uh, you know, participating in elections. So that is uh, the problem there. I would have liked to suggest, uh, do you have the provision of, uh, you know, um, providing training to their parents? for providing you know, kind of uh, the opportunity to participate in the electoral process. Uh, 
And also you have mentioned somewhere there earlier that uh, representatives of senators should be uh, educated or informed or aware of, uh, the, uh, of the rights of disabled people. And don't you think that, and that these disabled people or this section of society should also be represented themselves as a senator so that they can better play the role for their section of society? That is what I would have thought. Um, because in my country, and they, they wanted to represent themselves. And uh, they also wanted to be uh, categorized like physically disabled, wanted to be physically disabled, addressed as physically disabled, meant, and, and also blind, like to be addressed as a blind, and the deaf like to be addressed as deaf, so that they wanted to categorize and also wanted to get share of their representation in the, in the elected houses. So, um, what, what, what is the situation here in the uh, United States? I don't know that uh, much about that. And providing the, the, the voting rights uh, is, a, is a difficult thing because you have to have the um, ballots, and in the ballots you so, should have you know, kind of a braille and uh, how much is possi possible for all uh, our country to have this braille, you know, braille, um, uh, you know, particularly for the blind, and also uh, for others, um, how would we introduce this? And uh, for the facility, of course, there are a lot of uh, problems to develop in the polling centers and uh, educating them. I should share one small point that we have started providing training to the disabled people themselves about the elections and opportunity and what is their role and how they can get the you know, rights and they, they can exercise their rights. So we have started providing training for deaf and blind and physically disabled other groups. So that could uh, basically help uh, in, in making them aware and so that they can really participate. But bringing them in the electoral role itself is a very difficult thing because parents are not aware of and they don't bother for their disabled people there. Thank you very much. So I would like to say that um, it is, I agree with you completely that it's very important that family members be involved, uh, not just for the issue of elections, but to be able to encourage them uh, that their child with a disability has a right to education, a right to employment, and they can become advocates appropriately for their children. I do want to say also that um, you have, I believe, Virginia, in your folders, uh, two documents from the Department of Justice. There's a lot of materials, other materials online that you can look at to get a better understanding of many of the points that you're raising. I think one of the um, components within the ADA, uh, which is requiring that organizations serving disabled people provide information on uh, the process of registering to vote, helping them register, as well as um, encouraging people to vote. Um, is one way of also getting disability organizations involved. I just want to say before I came to government, numbers of organizations that I was involved with and organizations now are doing much more uh, with people that are running for the president, for senate, for local elections to um, make visible the fact that the disability community is registered to vote and will be participating in elections. Charlotte, did you want to address? Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment. I just, I, I wanted to thank you very much uh, for, for, for making the point around the importance of increasing the number of persons with disabilities as senators, as parliamentarians. That is an absolutely essential piece. That is happening, fortunately, um, almost organically in many places. So we're, we're definitely seeing a lot more senators with disabilities and we're seeing, seeing a lot more parliamentarians with disabilities. So. You know, that's, that's an important piece of it. And I just want to, to, to touch on the point around, you know, working with family members and parents. Um, you know, as I was saying, you can't see the Article 29 in isolation. You have to think about all of the other articles in the convention. And one of the other pieces of the convention is the importance of advocacy. And it really is about, you know, having campaigns, getting out there and getting parents to understand the importance of their children participating in, in elections, but as Judy mentioned, broader than just elections participating in society as, as citizens. 
Yeah, hi. I, I know we're pressed for time, but I wanted to, to respond to a couple of the questions or issues that you raised. One, certainly, to echo Judith, is, is outreach to parents or to legal guardians who, who may not share the, the understanding that the person with a disability has that they feel prepared to vote. They have a preference to express. They have a choice to make. And it may be different than their parents. And it may be different than their parents, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think in this country, and, and Judy can speak to this more than I can, but I think there has been a, a lot of work by people with disabilities and their advocates to reach out to parents and to guardians to, to help them understand um, <laughs> that it matters whether or not people with disabilities can exercise their right to vote independently. It, it may be part of a culture in this country around independence, but it's certainly part of the culture around for people with disabilities in this country to be independent and to cast, and, and voting is part of, of an independent life. So I, I, I think there is a lot of work that we can do here in the US, but that can be done everywhere to try to help parents and guardians understand that. I would also just add with, with respect to elected officials, a lot of disability advocates have put a lot of time into ensuring that judges who make decisions about not just voting, but about how disability rights laws are applied are either people with disabilities or people who have demonstrated an understanding of our disability rights laws. Um, I will say, although it doesn't always get a lot of attention in the US, but one of our um, judges on our Supreme Court is a person with insulin-treated diabetes who would probably be protected under the Americans with Disabilities she Act as a person with a disability. She is protected. Yeah. And so having her on the court, if there were a disability issue to come up, it, it is something we hope would be helpful. And having other judges with the same kinds of backgrounds um, would be really helpful, both, both as role models and in helping to develop our law. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the panelists for a really interesting and informative discussion, which we can hopefully continue out in the hallways.